You'll want to open your Bible again this morning to Philippians chapter 3. We've been working our way through this book of the Bible, which is really a, a letter uh, written by the Apostle Paul and his co-worker Timothy to their dear friends and partners in the gospel uh, in Philippi. Philippi was a city uh, in what in Bible times was called Macedonia. Today would be Greece. Um, and uh, Paul had been instrumental in establishing the church there uh, in Philippi some 10 years or so before this letter was written. So we'll, we'll uh, continue our study this morning in Philippians chapter 3, and we'll be reading verses 7 to 16. And we spent so much time in this book this year that by now your Bible probably actually just kind of falls open to Philippians, you know. But if you are using a white Bible from the pew rack, you'll find it on page 1018. Now, many of you, no doubt, are uh, familiar with this passage. It will sound familiar to you. It's fairly well known. Uh, but listen as I read it again for us this morning. Philippians chapter 3, beginning with verse 7. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings and becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all of this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Will you pray with me? Lord, as we open your word today, we pray that you by your Holy Spirit would come and would, would make your word clear to us, that you would teach us, Lord, that you would give us understanding. I pray that you might enable me to, to convey your truth um, with clarity and with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, may you help us to live in obedience to the things that you show us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've seen over the last few weeks how in this part of the letter, Paul is telling the Philippians a little bit about his own personal journey with, with Christ uh, and the change that happened when he encountered Christ, a complete reversal, really, of what he valued and what was important to him, what his life was centered around. So he talks some about his past, and then he talks about what motivates him now and um, what his life goals are as he looks to the future. So th there's a logic, really, to what he lays out here. Um, he, he talks first about treasuring Christ, really, about making him the thing that we value above all else. And uh, we talked about that two weeks ago. But if we treasure Christ, then it makes sense that we will want to know him more, right? Uh, which is what he says next and what we talked about last week. But it doesn't end there either, because if we want to know him more, then it makes sense that we will pursue him with all of our energy and focus. And that's what Paul goes on to talk about in these next verses, particularly in verses 12 to 16, which is where we're going to focus our thoughts this morning. By the way, when we use that phrase, pursuing Christ, um, what we're saying really is just that we're making every effort to grow deeper in our walk with him. Um, it's not that Christ is running away from us, uh, you know, or that, uh, that he's distant or uninterested or that we're trying to get his attention or, or trick him into helping us or anything like that as if he were, as if we were, you know, chasing him and he's trying to keep from getting caught. I know that we, we sometimes use the word pursuit in that way, don't we? One person is trying to get away while the other one's trying to catch them. But of course, that's not what we have in mind here. The truth is that 
that God has been pursuing us. And as we enter into a relationship with him and, and as we've been transformed by his spirit, the natural response should be to want to grow deeper, right? To, to know him more, to experience all that he intends for us. That's what we mean by pursuing Christ. Okay, I mean that being intentional about our, about our spiritual life, about our relationship with Christ, making him our focus, our treasure, our goal. And that's what Paul so vividly describes for us in this, in this passage. So treasuring Christ, knowing Christ, pursuing Christ. Actually, it brought to mind uh, this week the words uh, to an old song that I hadn't thought of in ages. Uh, some of you may remember it from back in the, I don't know, the 70s, I'm going to say. Um, day by day, day by day, oh dear Lord, three things I pray. To see thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, follow thee more nearly, day by day. I don't know if any of you remember that song. I'm not a big fan of the musical Godspell from which that song came, but I think that those lyrics are on target. And in, ma in many ways, they express what Paul is saying here. I want to see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly every day from now till I cross the finish line. So Paul is saying, I'm going to make every effort to ensure that that's true in my own life. I'm going to take the steps that are necessary for my own, for my own growth and forward progress in treasuring him and knowing him and in pursuing him. Warren Wearsby, in his commentary on Philippians, gives us what I think is a, is, is a helpful summary of this passage in five words. He notes that what Paul describes here is, first of all, a dissatisfaction. A dissatisfaction. That is, that he hasn't arrived where he wants to be, and so he's going to keep, he's going to keep pressing on. He's not satisfied with where he is uh, in, his, in his spiritual walk. He's going to keep moving forward. Secondly, devotion. That is, that he's devoted or he's focused on this one thing. One thing I do, he says, right? That's, that's focus, isn't it? One thing I do, that's devotion. This is, this is where he focuses his energy. Then there's direction. Direction. He's not focused on the past, notice, but he's focused in a, in a different direction toward the future, pushing forward. Uh, and to that is added determination. He's, he's all in. He's... He's pressing, pressing on. He's straining toward the goal. He's determined. And finally, there is discipline. That is, that like an athlete, he's, he's, um, he's going to do what it takes. He's going to discipline himself to make sure that, uh, that uh, he gets to the finish line. So Wearsby summarizes uh, this passage in those five words. Dissatisfaction, devotion, direction, determination, and discipline. I, I think that's helpful because it's, it's really uh, a, a description in many ways of Paul's approach to the Christian life. Yeah. Does that describe your approach too? Because that's what it's going to take to get to the finish line. Now, let's be clear. Paul is not talking here about, about how to be saved. If he were, then he'd be talking about, about getting there on his own effort. And Paul is certainly not teaching that. If, you, if you've been here as we've studied through here, you'll remember that he makes clear in, those, in the first 11 verses of this same chapter that, that he puts no confidence in his own or anybody else's efforts to try to get to God uh, that way, to try to work their way to God. I tried that, he says, it got me nowhere. We come to God only by his grace, only on the basis of what Christ has done on the cross, not by our own effort. But you remember back in chapter 2 and verse uh, in verse 12, how Paul says to us, though, that we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. And remember, we said that's not about how we, we come to be a believer, but how we, how we respond to that. So th th there's a clear call to action there to make every effort to live out the implications of our salvation in our daily life. And we do that, as we said, not to earn our salvation, but as a logical response to our salvation. If Christ really is our treasure, that which is of supreme worth to us, then we need to be all in. And as we do that, as this verse points out, it's really God who is the one then who empowers us, who enables us, who does the work in us and through us. So here's what it comes down to. Forward progress in our uh, spiritual life depends on, uh, in part on a couple of things. Desire and drive, right? 
desire and drive. Paul's already talked in the previous verses about desire, but now he's talking about drive. Desire alone is not enough. Desire must be matched by drive. I mean, you could, you could have someone whose greatest desire is, um, is to be a brain surgeon, let's say. And we say, well, great, good for them. But I can tell you they'll never get there if that desire is not also matched by, by drive, by a determined effort, because it's going to take a lot of work to get there. And if you're going to grow as a follower of Jesus Christ, the desire to, to know him that we talked about last week needs to be accompanied by the drive to pursue him with all of your effort. But as Philippians 2.12 reminds us, it's God who's doing that work in us um, and that makes both of those things possible. God, by his grace and by his spirit, stirs up in us a desire, doesn't he? And as I said, that desire needs to be accompanied then by decisions that you make and steps that you pursue, that you, that you uh, take to pursue that desire. But you're not on your own as, as, as in trying to, to do that and trying to accomplish that and trying to live for Christ because God is there to enable you and to guide you and to help you and to empower you as you make those decisions and you take those steps for your growth as you press on toward, toward the prize. So in these verses, Paul tells us something of what that looks like. And, and he, he uses here an athletic metaphor, a word picture from the, from the world of sports. And Paul likes to do that. He, he must have been kind of a sports guy. I don't know. But, but um, you remember in other places he uses sports metaphors like boxing and, and wrestling. But uh, here he pictures the Christian life as a race. And notice that for Paul, salvation is not the finish line in this race. No, it's the starting line. It's where our race begins. And Paul gives us here some advice about how to run that race uh, from his own experience and from his own approach to running the race as God has helped him to do that. First, he says, you've got to refuse to quit. Refuse to quit. That is, you've got to be in this till you get to the finish line, till it's done, with your eyes focused on the prize. Notice what Paul says here, verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or have already arrived at the goal. I'm not done yet, he says. Verse, verse 13. Um, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, he says. I'm not there yet. So what do I do if I'm not there yet? I keep going, right? I don't quit. I press on. If anybody could have rested on his laurels, it could have been Paul, right? I mean, and, and now here he is in prison, and he could have said, well, you know, it was a great run while it lasted, right? But, uh, but now it's done. No. No, it's not, Paul says. I'm not quitting. I've, I've, st I've still got more to go, and I'm going to keep on pressing on. I, I don't know if any of you saw that one race um, in the last Olympics where the one gal got kind of tangled up with the other, and and down she went, and and um, and she could, you know, she could have said, "Well, that's that's it. You know, I'm I'm done. I'm out. There, there's no hope. There's no chance." But that's not what she did. She she immediately jumped up and she took off like a rocket. I mean, she just was moving. And in spite of the fact that she was significantly behind the rest of the, the, of the pack, she didn't quit. And in fact, she caught up and she placed. I, I, if I remember right, it was, it was uh, just one of the heats. So she, did, she didn't get a medal for that race, but she, she did do well enough to advance to the medal round. You know, lots of people start the Christian life well, don't they? But I want to finish well, don't you? I want to finish well. It's easy to start well. Anybody can start well. But, but we got to keep going. We can't quit. You know, we, we can all think, let's be honest, we can all think of examples of people who started well but didn't finish well. In fact, your Bible is full of examples of people like that too. People who started well but didn't finish well. Paul says, not me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay in the race. I'm going to make every effort to finish well because I'm not there yet. 
I haven't yet obtained the prize. I haven't gotten to the finish line. So when is it time to quit? When you die. In other words, not yet. Right? Not yet. You know, I was saying to somebody just the other day that I love the fact that some of you older folks are so involved in loving on these kids and ministering to them, the kids who, who we bring here to the church. You know, we're perhaps accustomed to hearing that children and, and senior adults don't really mix in a church, right? But I love the fact that in our church, that's not so, <laughs> that the older folks uh, love the children and that the, the children love, love the older folks. And, and seniors, I love the fact that you're in there, involved. Good for you. Race isn't done. It's too soon to sit around and talk about the old days, right? <laughs> you're still in the race. So what's the motivation here then? What's the motivation for staying in the race, for not quitting? Well, Paul mentions a number of things here. One certainly is the prize. I, I want to win the prize, he says. Now, interestingly, the text never says specifically what the prize is. Um, I don't think Paul's talking about his salvation here because he already has that prize. Perhaps the prize he's thinking of is, is to hear his Savior say, well done, good and faithful servant. Don't you want to hear those words? I do. Well done. Well done. Or perhaps it's the crown of righteousness that Paul writes about, uh, writes to Timothy about in 2 Timothy 4, 8, where he says, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Perhaps that's the prize he was thinking of. I don't know. But he was in it for the prize. But he's also motivated, notice, by what Christ has done for him. Notice verse 12. I press on, he says, to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. I like the way that the ESV expresses it. It says, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus made me his own. Isn't that beautiful? There's the motivation. Jesus Christ came after me and he didn't quit. And he didn't give up on me, and so I'm going to go after him and, and not stop. Jesus aggressively pursued me, and thank God he did. Amen? Thank God he did. So now I'm going to aggressively pursue him with all that I have. You see, Paul's, Paul's not driven by guilt here, but by gratitude. Gratitude for what Christ has done for him. You know, so many Christians seem to do things uh, for God out of guilt. Have you noticed that? Or is that maybe true of you? They read their Bibles because they feel guilty if they don't. They come to church because they feel guilty if they don't. They feel this burden of guilt because they haven't shared Christ like they know that they should, so they feel guilty. But listen, God doesn't want us to be motivated by guilt. That's the enemy's tactic. Make us feel guilty. But we can be and we should be motivated by gratitude. Gratitude for, for all that Christ has done for us. Gratitude that he didn't give up on us, but he continued to pursue us even when we pushed him away. Gratitude. I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So first, don't quit. Finish well. But secondly, he says, if you're going to run this race, if you're going to pursue Christ, then you got to stop looking back. Stop looking back. You know, you can't run a race looking backward, can you? You can't. So Paul says, I am forgetting what is behind. You see that there? I'm forgetting what is behind. Not forgetting God's goodness, not forgetting the valuable lessons uh, of the past, but not dwelling on the past in a way that hinders our our present effort and our future progress. You know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, we, we, can, we can be hindered by constantly looking back at our negative experiences or at our failures. It's, it's one of the enemy's favorite tactics. He, he wants you to believe that the mistakes and the failures and the, and the bad decisions of the past, and maybe even the things that were done to you in the past, are somehow going to determine 
what God wants to do with you in the future. Listen, it's a lie. It's a lie. The enemy wants you to feel defeated and condemned because of what you have done or what was done to you in the past. But if you believe, as this book says, that, that Christ's blood shed on the cross is sufficient for every sin, every sin, then every sin is covered under the blood of Jesus and you can move forward in victory. The enemy wants to just keep replaying that same, same old movie of your past failures to keep you paralyzed from moving forward. But if you are a child of God, then listen, your past does not control your present or your future because Christ has taken care of all of that on the cross. So stop looking back, forgetting what is behind, Paul says, forgetting what is behind. Listen, you need to learn to be a good forgetter. You say, oh, believe me, no problem there. I forget all kinds of stuff, you know. But the stuff that I want to forget, I can't seem to. Well, I can relate to that. But, you know, I, I think that we have a wrong idea of what the Bible means when, when it talks about forgetting. To forget in the Bible uh, means to no longer be influenced or affected by the past. It doesn't mean that it's wiped out of our memory banks, you know, like, like that we have no, no memory of it any longer. Um, but it does mean that that memory doesn't any longer have any power over us. God has broken the power of the past to determine our present and our future. We can't change the past. But by the grace of God, we can change its influence and its impact on our lives. You know, but you know, it's, it's, it's not just the negative things of the past that Paul is talking about here. Remember, in, in this context here, in, in Philippians chapter 3, Paul's been talking, in, like in, particularly in verses 4 through 6 there, about all of the things that he could, he could have boasted about. Right? So I think he's also referring here not just to the negative things of the past, but also to the danger of always looking back at the accomplishments and the achievements of the past, at our successes. Because listen, that can also keep us from moving forward sometimes, can't it? If we just keep living in the past. A couple of weeks ago, we celebrated our 35th anniversary as, as a church. And as we did that, we were reflecting on the story of how God had brought us to this point. And we were, we were celebrating, remembering some of the stories of, of the early days and what God did. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But of course, we can't just be living in the glory days of the past either, can we? We're to be pressing forward. And if, if we spend all of our time looking back, we'll, we'll never be able to move forward. It was fun to think back on those, on those days, especially for those of you who became a part of this church family back then in that time. Uh, some of you enjoyed looking through the picture albums from those days when you were all younger and Everybody had big hair and all of that, you know. <laughs> yeah, just hair at all in some cases, yeah. <laughs> Listen, there's no doubt that, that, the, uh, that the, the past provides us with many valuable uh, lessons, uh, both positive and negative, that we ignore uh, our own peril. But we can't live in the past, even if we wanted to, can we? We celebrate what God has done, and, and rightfully so. But he calls us not to live on the memories of the past, but to continue to move forward. You can't live on old manna, so to speak. It's gotta be, it's gotta, it needs to be fresh every day. And listen, we can have every expectation and assurance that God will be just as real and just as powerful and just as present with us today as he was back in the days when the church was just beginning. You know, I think of the past sort of like being a rear view mirror. You know, a rear view mirror in your car is, is extremely helpful, isn't it? It helps you to, to orient yourself with regard to what's behind you, not only what's ahead. But you can't drive by only looking in the rear view mirror, can you? You can't. That's why the windshield is this big and the rear view mirror is this big, right? <laughs> the only value in, in looking back is to be able to carry forward the, the vision and the passion that were such a part of the beginnings of this church or the enthusiasms of your early days as a, as a believer. I'm not suggesting 
that we waste any time saying, oh, it's not like the old days. These aren't the old days. These are new days with new challenges. But I pray that God will awaken in us the same vision and the same passion that many of you remember from those beginning days. God's not done, friends. He's not done. And, and the race is not over. He has an exciting future for each one of us and for us as a church. And I believe that many of you sense, as I do, that there is an increasing hunger among us to know God and to see him work in, in a mighty way to transform lives and to empower his church. So let's, let's, let's ask God to keep it fresh. Amen. Let's, let's get on our knees and seek him and ask him by his Holy Spirit to fill us anew and to fan again the flame of, of our passion for him. In other words, let's, let's move forward. Let's, let's press on. Let's pursue him with all of our energy and focus. So Paul says, don't quit. And he says, stop looking back. Looking back at past failures can lead to discouragement and condemnation. Looking back at past successes can lead to pride and complacency. Looking back at past disagreements can lead to bitterness and, and disunity. So beware of the dangers of spending all your time looking back. Those things, you know, those things can become almost like this heavy uh, backpack, you know, that, that we that we carry of, of, of things that are from the uh, from the past. Um, it, but they keep us from being able to run the race. Can, can you imagine seeing somebody come to the starting line of a race wearing a 70 pound backpack? No. Listen, we, we can't be lugging around the stuff from the past, good or bad. It's going to weigh you down. It's going to knock you out of the race. You need to let it go. Finally, let me mention one more thing. I'll, I'll be brief because I know um, we've come to the end of our time here. But Paul is urging us here to run to win. Run to win. In your pursuit of Christ, run with determination, run with dedication, run with discipline, run to win. You know, in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, he also uses uh, the metaphor of a race. And he says in 1 Corinthians 9 and verses 24 to 27, he says this. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I don't run like someone running aimlessly. I don't fight like a boxer just beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Run to win. Don't be aimless, he says, in your Christian walk. Now, of course, every metaphor, as we know, breaks down at some point if you try and press it too hard. So let, let me be clear that Paul is not saying that only one person is going to get the prize. But he is saying you need to run like it. Right? Run to win. Sometimes I, I, I see people whose approach to, to walking with Christ seems to be to do the bare minimum that they can, that they can get away with, if I can put it that way. I, like I said last week, you know, they, they want enough of Jesus to get them to heaven, but not much more. They want enough of Jesus to make him comfortable or, or respectable or, or whatever, but... but uh, but not much more. That's certainly not the picture that you get in this passage, is it? I'm in it to win the prize, Paul says. I'm in it to finish well. Is that you? And if it is, what are you doing to make that happen? What decisions are you making? What steps are you taking that will lead you then to a closer relationship with Christ and that will enable you to finish well? Is there a holy dissatisfaction with where you are now? Is your life marked by devotion, direction, determination, and discipline? Paul says here in verse 15 that to live that way is a sign of maturity, actually. It's a sign of maturity. And the rest of that verse goes on to assure us that if we aren't there yet, that God is committed to to helping us to get there, to showing us by His Spirit where we are and how we can get to where He wants us to be. So we don't do this on our own. But neither will He do it for you if you make no effort. So, where do we start? Where do we start? Well, how about with that phrase, 
in verse 16 that the text ends with this morning. Let us live up to what we have already attained. Let us live up to what we've already attained. In other words, most of us already know more than what we live. Isn't that true? <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean that our, our, our problem is generally not a shortage of knowledge. It's not that, that we don't know what we're supposed to do or how we're supposed to live. We know. We know what we should do. Our, our problem is in putting that knowledge into action, isn't it? Simply put, much of what we know when it comes to our Christian walk, we don't do. Isn't that so? So don't get hung up on the idea that you don't know enough. Most of us already know far more than what we do. <laughs> so how about we start there? Let us live up to what we have already attained. In other words, let's start putting into action what we already know. And then as we do that, as we take those steps, then we'll begin a process of growth and God will be faithful then to show us the next step and the step after that and after that and we will learn to live in his ways. So start where you are, but don't stay there. Press on, grow, pursue Christ with everything you've got. He's worth it. He's worth it. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word to us today. It challenges us, certainly. Because it's true that we often already, we already know this. We just aren't always living it. So help us to, to live up to what we've already attained, what we've already learned. But Lord, help us not to just stay there, but to continue on, to press on, to pursue you with our whole heart. Lord, we want to thank you today that you are our greatest treasure, that there is nothing that has greater value than you. So help us to know you more and help us to pursue you with our whole heart. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.